uh, greetings, everyone. It's uh, morning here in Northern California, but it might be uh, any time where you are. So I'm just uh, greeting all of you. And our topic today is nonviolence and what's called the new story. Uh, as we all know from the work of Paul Hawken, the state of the progressive movement, the nonviolent movement in the world today, is that there are millions of very worthwhile projects happening, literally millions, but they are not coordinated into a movement. And it's uh, thought, I believe, among others, that what's needed is a training of individuals, what's needed is a, a strategy for the movement and some kind of sense of unity and diversity. So what I'm going to be addressing today is one particular example, because I think it might be a critical example, of two different communities that are working more or less in isolation and need to be brought together. The first is a community of social thinkers who are working to help bring about a major, what they call a cultural paradigm shift now, you may be aware that the great uh, peace researcher Kenneth Boulding talked about the peace movement on the one hand and the movement toward peace on the other hand. The peace movement consisted of formal organizations and the movement toward peace is something much harder to define, much more diffuse coming up from the grassroots. And that's happening with this particular shift. Also, there are people working on it consciously like Joanna Macy and David Corton, who call it the great turning. And then there's something that just seems to be in the air, if you will. So uh, most recently, Naomi Klein has been calling it the leap. And in fact, uh, tonight, she's going to be talking about her new book called No is Not Enough. And also talking about the leap, a new organization dedicated to making system change inevitable, irresistible, and common sense. So on the part of these uh, thinkers, this is mostly a thought project, but her approach is a bit of an exception because she has direct action counterparts. So uh, this, is, as you already have heard, it's been called a number of things, but I'm gonna refer to it as a shift from the old story to the new story even though those are really slightly misnomers, both of those terms. The old story is a cultural paradigm that seems to really install itself throughout the time of the Industrial Revolution, which is just an eye blink away in terms of cultural history. And the new story, quote unquote, is actually a perennial story. It's, it's been around forever. So I want to talk a little bit about what that new story is and then talk about the other community, which is our own community, the nonviolence community, and what nonviolence means and how to get these two fields of thought married. I think that's an absolutely critical process because uh, among others, I believe that unless this shift can be made to happen, nothing will be working for us. Let me just give you one quick example. There was an episode in Beirut last year where a suicide bomber blew himself up and uh, killed a number of people. And there was a man in the market at that time named Adel Termos and he had his nine-year-old daughter with him and he noticed that the man had an accomplice. It was another bomber who was about to do the same thing. So he threw himself on the other bomber. And um, of course, uh, they both died instantly in the explosion. But Termos probably saved the life of a number of people, which now this kind of thing does happen. And what I'm interested in is the way that the press handled it, because they said that what Ad Adele Termos did broke human nature. That's a very old story idea that human nature is separate and selfish. And it becomes extremely difficult to understand nonviolence in that framework. What I would say is that what he really did was display a potential, a glorious potential in human nature. 
And we need to get to a point where the media is aware of this and it becomes part of our cultural norms. Uh, and when that happens, the tremendous developments that have been taking place in nonviolence, nonviolent action over the last 80 or so years will really, really take off. And uh, that will be the dawn of a new era, which I hope to live long enough to see. Anyway, uh, to shift over now to uh, the nonviolence community, I'm going to be talking in a little bit, by the way, about uh, why the, uh, the marriage of the two communities is so important and what exactly I mean by both of them. So let me just show you actually this quote from one of the scholars who's working on this new development. Her name is Sally Gurner, professor in North Carolina. And she said, since transformational change is a matter of when, not if, the real question becomes, and I've highlighted this, whether such change will be smooth or catastrophic. Pressure is building and stuckness is everywhere. Think of education. She and I were both professors, so that little last bit was very personal for us. But she gives you the feeling of almost building up to an earthquake. And shifts like this can be extremely catastrophic. And so our job becomes making sure that the transition is not catastrophic, but smooth. And that is where nonviolence uh, again comes in, because nonviolence, as we know, is a way of making social change happen without a disaster. And that kind of disaster usually just goes back to the same old, same old after a brief period. But if you want to come to a stable, harmonic situation and yet go through severe changes, uh, drastic changes, the only way to do that is through nonviolent action. So uh, what, what exactly do I mean and what do other people mean by this new story? Well, here's what the universe looks like in the old story. This is the old model. The idea is that everything consists of matter and somehow there is energy that acts on matter. It's a random universe that evolution and in fact all changes are based on the random motion of material particles which can have no purpose. And because of our, our material nature, all objects are separate and that in includes us living beings. We are separate from one another in the sense that it is entirely possible that my well-being may cost you yours, that you may have to suffer in order for me to thrive, in order for me to survive in this model. And therefore, life is driven by competition. So you have a, a physics based on materialism, a biology based on competition. That was what was done with Darwin, although he didn't actually mean it in that sense. And then, of course, you have social Darwinism and competition and uh, destructive conflict and wars become an inevitable in that model. So I hope you are as fed up as I am with this picture and let's get rid of it. Here's the new turning, the great turning to the new model. In it, the universe is made primarily of consciousness, which uh, in some mysterious way, creates an appearance of matter and energy. Uh, evolution is driven by a purpose. And if you look back over the last 13.7 billion years, it's quite obvious that what evolution has been doing is creating vehicles for higher and higher consciousness. Just think of uh, the consciousness involved of us debating, considering these uh, epic making ideas here uh, today compared to the consciousness that's in a, I don't know, a paramecium or uh, even an inert, an inert object. And with that higher consciousness, of course, comes a sense of agency. The third point that we might list here is that it, instead of uh, being separate, all objects and especially all living beings, 
are an interconnected whole. Living beings, and in particular in terms of this planet, the human being has the capacity to become aware of that wholeness. And in this model, life is not driven by competition. Competition certainly does exist, but as biologists like Bruce Lipton and Elizabeth Saturas and many others are saying today, cooperation has played a much greater role in evolution than competition. In fact, uh, Dr. Saturas has been showing that at every big major change in evolution, every great leap was a leap from competition to cooperation. So what about the microcosm now? That's, that's the whole universe. In the microcosm of the human being, in the old model, we're basically bodies. And then somehow, is bodies cause minds. That is, the brain causes us to have thoughts and emotions and desires and so forth, so that uh, there's also a mention of something called spirit, but it gets increasingly nebulous as you go up this ladder of causality. And this is called upward causation. Now, if you uh, hold on to your seats, now we're going to go through the paradigm shift before your very eyes. Ready? Bang. In the new model, we are spiritual beings encased in bodies and up on which we operate through the agency of mind. We are spiritual beings seeking unity instead of material beings seeking material gratification. So this is a really drastic, simple model of the paradigm shift that's trying to happen through the grassroots and also through the work of some of these uh, scholars and individuals. So the consequences of this for our next uh, community now, our next topic, this is kind of a bridge from the new story part of uh, my presentation to the nonviolence part. The consequences of this new model are dramatic. We uh, discover that we have impressive inner resources and that immediately takes pressure off the planet because we don't have to exploit the planet for energy and food more than we need which as Gandhi showed was really quite minimal and therefore it reduces or eventually could eliminate uh, competition and destructive conflict. Now, like most nonviolence people, I don't think that conflict will go away ever, and I don't think that, it, that we want it to, because conflict is an opportunity for creative resolution, leading to a higher reconciliation and resolution of the conflicting parties. In fact, in the kind of nonviolence that I'm going to be talking about, we actually believe that there is no such thing as an irreducible conflict. On the level of underlying needs, all human needs can be met. They are not in competition with one another. It's only the strategies that we use to get those needs satisfied that puts us into what seem to be irresolvable conflicts. But anyway, to move on, then the whole concept of security does not come from catching and incarcerating them and punishing them. And we have an institution that's slowly coming up that responds to this new model of security, which is known as common security. And on the domestic level, in terms of criminal justice, it's a shift, the paradigm shift we're talking about represents itself or is uh, instantiated in a shift from the present model of retributive justice to a new model of restorative justice. And the fantastic success of programs in restorative justice is one way of seeing that the new story is much more accurate and drastically needed. On the other hand, the fact that restorative justice is not growing sooner is because the old story, the old paradigm, is still in place, 
and there's no way of explaining it. Let me give you at this point one simple example. There was a school in Boston, which is a very, very tough school, and the principal, a young guy came in to be the principal, and everybody warned him, this is the end of your career, man. You, you know, no one's ever survived in this place more than three or five years. You'll, you'll be leaving in disgrace. And, but he took on the job, and the first thing that he did was to fire the security staff. And with the money that he saved from the security staff, he restarted the art project, the art program in that school. And now what would you predict would be the result if you were operating in the old story? Well, I predict it would be a disaster. Kids would be stealing art supplies and fighting over them. But the actual result was that the violence subsided almost to nothing. It came down to a very, very manageable minimum. Now, in the new story, we can explain this because we said that what this person did was to uh, tap into the student's creativity to give them a higher sense of who they are and to give them a greater sense of their own dignity and, and creativity. And as we know from the work of a forensic psychiatrist, Harold Gilligan, uh, most, if not all, violence brings from a sense of humiliation and a need to uh, gain self-respect. So if you give the kids self-respect, they, they don't need to fight, they don't need to compete as much. So now if we take this up to the international level, in the change, peace will no longer come from defeating enemies, but from reconciling with them. So while the diplomacy and the world courts and all of those international institutions are slowly being built up, we also need a way to uh, diffuse open conflict, shooting conflict, and protect, especially protect civilians. And for that, we also have a new institution on that level. It used to be called a Third Party Nonviolent Institution. Uh, it's now called Unarmed Civilian Peacekeeping, and there are about 12 organizations uh, worldwide that are doing this. And I'm happy to say that they're, they're going to meet pretty soon and think about a concerted strategy, which is a very good move. So uh, nonviolence has been defined in many different ways. And uh, just this morning, as a matter of fact, I got a notice of a Gandhi course, a year-long Gandhi course, seventh time going on in an institution in Gujarat State in India called Gujarat Vidya Peet, Gujarat University. And in this course, they say they're going to talk about principle and strategic nonviolence, which are terms that I like to use. They're going to talk about nonviolence of the weak and the coward. They're going to talk about genuine versus counterfeit nonviolence and absolute and existential nonviolence. But I would like to use the terms uh, that Gandhi himself used, which is nonviolence of the weak versus nonviolence of the strong. Uh, in this model, you'll see that I have been constantly using nonviolence as a noun, and that I don't particularly like the model uh, or the dichotomy that is sometimes used of the difference between uh, moral and pragmatic, because uh, Gandhi felt, and Max Weber felt, and for what it's worth, I also feel that in the long run, there is no difference between the correct thing to do, the ethically right thing to do, and the most pragmatic thing to do. And I'll be citing an example of that in a little while. But Gandhi said, uh, so far you have been seeing the nonviolence of the weak. I give you the nonviolence. When you see the nonviolence of the strong, you will be amazed by its power. And he also said, interestingly, the nonviolence I teach is the nonviolence of the strongest, but the weakest can partake in it without becoming weaker. 
Now that's an important point because sometimes when we hear these dichotomies, we think they are an either or. Nonviolence is either strong in the sense that you have a deep ethical commitment to it. It's what we call principled nonviolence or it's nothing. But in fact, you can practice strategic nonviolence, the nonviolence of the weak, and even the nonviolence of the weak is sometimes stronger than the violence of those who are strong in that way. So it does, even the nonviolence of the weak has impressive power. Often people, when they participate in it, get a sense that they have seen the tip of the iceberg, that there is some deep power within themselves and within society that they want to learn more about. So uh, I'm trying to map Gandhi's dichotomy of nonviolence of the weak, nonviolence of the strong, onto uh, several other of these models. In what he called nonviolence of the weak, the definition of power is negative. That is, power comes from the withdrawal of consent. And this can be explained in the old story. Let's say you have a dictator and he, or very rarely she, needs to control their people. And they do that uh, through their uh, pillars of power. And if they refuse to uh, obey, then that person loses his power. And uh, he may or may not like it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he, what's going on in his heart. But strong nonviolence can only really be explained by the theory that human beings seek connection, seek unity with one another. And when you offer dignity and connectedness to an opponent, that produces a draw, an attractive force that draws that opponent over into your position. Uh, incidentally, the term uh, to offer dignity was a definition of nonviolence that became popular in the Philippines. And I think it's one of the best translations of ahimsa, nonviolence that I ever uh, heard of. So the, the critical difference between weak and strong nonviolence and the reason that I spend my time trying to develop uh, strong nonviolence is that strong nonviolence is part of the new story. Now, if you look over on the left-hand column, I'm just also trying to map Gandhi's dichotomy onto a formula that we sometimes use. In my own life, I remember seeing Joan Baez on the steps of Sproul Hall, at the beginning of the free speech movement in 1964, when she said, now we're going to be nonviolent and we're going to be nonviolent in thought, word, and deed. So to be nonviolent only in deed, while you're harbor negative feelings, ill will towards another, is what we call weak nonviolence. To be nonviolent in thought, where you actually try to overcome your sense of enmity, of alienation towards the other person, that is strong nonviolence. And nonviolence in speech would be somewhere in between. Incidentally, I put those little quote marks around thought because that's more than thought. And I want to go on and say a little bit more about that now. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, using the term strategic and principled nonviolence in the, when the Arab Spring came to Yemen a couple of years ago, there was a, a protester who said, they can't defeat us because we left our weapons at home. And that was a classic example of strategic nonviolent thinking. And it, it is not at all incorrect in saying that. But if he were a principled nonviolence guy, he might have said something like, we will win them over because we left our hatred at home. Now, here's an example of how that works. This is a quote from the British historian Arnold Toynbee, who said, Gandhi made it impossible for us to go on ruling India, but he made it possible for us to leave without rancor and without humiliation. 
I think this is an important principle that nonviolent actors often forget, that when they seek to humiliate an opponent, they make it exceedingly difficult for that opponent to yield. And I think it's our job as nonviolent actors not only to block the opposition from the injustice that they're carrying out, but to make it emotionally, spiritually possible for them to come around to our point of view uh, as much as we possibly can. And we do that namely by separating the person from the deed and say, we hate what you're doing, but we are open to you. Then you have this lovely model that Barbara Deming developed called the two hands of nonviolence. With one hand, I really should have a picture of this, you're holding up your hand and saying, stop, I will not accept your injustice. But with the other hand as a gesture of opening, you're saying, but I am open to you as a human being. So that's the magical combination that makes principled nonviolence so effective. And here's where that power, that positive sense of power really comes from. I think this is a definitive quote on that subject from Gandhiji. He said, I have learned the one supreme lesson to conserve my anger. And as heat conserved is transmuted into energy, our anger controlled can be transmuted into a power that can move the world. We all know what a destructive power hatred is, but we sometimes fail to recognize that that can be turned on its head, that that very same power or even greater power can be unleashed when we have found a way to conserve, as Gandhi says, that anger. It doesn't mean that we consciously have to feel love for the opposition, so that's very nice if you can swing that. If you're, if you're a Gandhi, you can do that. That's uh, really the ultimate acme of nonviolence. But if you just say to yourself, I will not act on this anger, not just because it's not strategic, but because it, it will not make things better, it is not the right way to go, then that anger is transmuted into what he calls a power that can move the world. He also didn't hesitate to call that power love. And when that transmutation is actually a reversion back to the original force uh, that that power was. Now here you see Gandhiji at the climax of the climax. This is the moment when he's picking up salt, April 1930, and launching the salt campaign. And he's now at this point, he's using the term civil disobedience because that is one component of nonviolent action. It says civil disobedience is a sovereign method of transforming undisciplined, life-destroying latent energy into disciplined, life-saving energy. So let's just let that sink in for a second. also gives me a chance to have a sip of tea. So transforming undisciplined energy into disciplined energy, and that was picked up by Martin Luther King when he said, we caused no outbursts of anger. We expressed anger under discipline for maximum effect. Now, as many of us are now aware, we have, uh, for the first time, studies of nonviolence in the formal academic fields of political science. And we have this marvelous resource, this work done by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. She has just written a very nice article, co-authored a very nice article that was in The Guardian today. But their book is called Why Civil Resistance Works. They studied uh, something like a 200 episodes of regime change over the last 110 years and classified them as of using violence, that is using overt violence, 
we're talking or using at least strategic nonviolence. And they found that those that were nonviolent in that sense were successful about 56% of the time. Whereas re, re, uh, revolutions that resorted to violence were only successful, I think, about 24% of the time. Uh, more surprisingly still, despite the fact that everyone's going to tell you that nonviolence takes longer, in fact, they took about two to three years to run their course, whereas violent resurrections took about nine years to, because they usually led to a bloody civil war and a stalemate. And the most surprising fact, at least if you don't use the new story paradigm, the most surprising fact is that they were four times more likely to lead to democracy, this is nonviolent uprisings, even if it failed. So even if you end up and the dictator is still in power, what you have done is to inject a nonviolent energy into the system, which leads to better outcomes, in this case to democratic freedoms. If the nonviolent uprising succeeded, incidentally, it was 10 times more likely to lead to democratic freedoms uh, 10 years down the road. So uh, this is part of a principle that we can recognize operating in nonviolence, and I call it work versus work. That is work in quotes versus doing good work. Nonviolence, in whatever context it's applied, may or may not, quote, work. It may or may not succeed in getting you what you exactly wanted to get you in the short term. But it always makes things better. Whereas violence also succeeds, quote, unquote, part of the time, but it always makes things worse. So you could say that nonviolence sometimes works, quote unquote, but it always works, whereas violence sometimes works, quote unquote, but it never works, never does good work. Now, I just wanted to say a word also about where we are with the shift to nonviolence. Uh, in the last 80 years, we have seen new players, new collaborations coming on, to the scene. This was very dramatic in Standing Rock, where you not only had close to 300 tribes of Native Americans uh, participating jointly and suffering together. It was, that was absolutely unprecedented uh, in the history of Tur Turtle Island. But you also had collaborations between Native Americans and European origin Americans at an absolutely unprecedented level. <clears throat> So Standing Rock was a good example of something that may not have, quote, worked, unquote. It's not really certain yet, but it certainly did tremendously good work, which is going to give us potential sources of greater strength going forward. And violence has seen the creation of new institutions in which it can be embodied, like the two that I mentioned earlier, restorative justice and unarmed civilian peacekeeping, and the astounding development of new science, uh, just that I mentioned briefly, uh, emerging from the new story. You see, the sources of the new story really are twofold. You have the ancient uh, wisdom tradition, which has always maintained that the human being was a spiritual being seeking unity and this tremendous uh, revolution in science, which I would love to say more about if we had more time. There will be a science uh, uh, website incorporated in our website, metacenter.org, I hope coming out in a few weeks. But one of the big changes that gives us a very propitious state of the art, if we can succeed in getting the uh, new story communities and the nonviolence communities together is the learning that has happened. It was traditionally the case that military science was highly advanced and you studied every single episode, every single conflict, 
for its strengths and weaknesses, its best practices. That was never done in nonviolence until recently. You have an organization like the Center for Advanced Nonviolent Actions and Strategies that came out of the Atpur Revolution. And if I may mention, I have a book called The Nonviolence Handbook, which has been translated into Arabic, into Chinese, into many other languages, and is, I'm happy to say, has actually been used. Not to the extent that Gene Sharp's manuals have been used, but it also is getting out there. And as mentioned earlier, you have a systematic study of the field of nonviolence, especially uh, we might mention, um, again, uh, the Chenoweth and Stefan book, Why Civil Resistance Works. So uh, we, uh, this is an important, helpful development. And Serge Popovich, who was part of the Utpour uh, revolution, said, we'd already been using nonviolent resistance for some time. But to find out what we were doing was written in a book, that was very helpful. It's tremendously helpful to know you're part of a historical development, that you're part of others, and of course, that you have the capacity to learn across different fields what works and what doesn't work. So this is the, um, the end point uh, of my presentation almost. I'm going to go on and show you a model that uh, Meta Center is using. But uh, Gandhi said that nonviolence is the nature of the human as violence is of the brute. And this, uh, I think, is the final development that we're leading to with this new story on the one hand and the uprising of nonviolent action on the other hand. Well, at Meta, we're trying to uh, display the unity and diversity of all the different movements uh, in this model that we call the roadmap. And using Gandhian strategies, we uh, talk about develop personal empowerment, starting with person power, personal empowerment, going to constructive action, constructive program where you build what you want, and finally taking on nonviolent resistance where that is still necessary. And just to focus for a second on person power, we have a number of suggestions, five, that any individual can take up. First of all, to step out of the old story by uh, not watching television, have we, you know, avoid the mass media as much as possible, use it with great discretion. You'll save a lot of time that way, for one thing, you use that time to learn nonviolence, learn everything you can about it. Uh, hats off to ICNC for the terrific work that they're doing to make this possible. Take up a spiritual practice if you don't already have one. And then just the simple act of being more personal with people, everyone that you interact with, uh, is tremendously helpful. I won't go into the theory of that exactly right now. And whatever you're doing, this is our final recommendation, whatever you are doing, explain how it's working and why you're doing it by telling the new story. Just to close with one little anecdote, some a very wealthy person who was nonetheless a very good-hearted man was, uh, they tried to recruit him to be an economic hitman and to go down to some Central American country and wreck their economy and make a lot of money. And he said he would not do that. And the person who was trying to recruit him said, why do you care about those people? W which is kind of a stinging thing to hear. Now imagine if he had been able to articulate, well, I care about them because we're all interconnected and so on and so forth. By our telling that story here, there, and everywhere when we get a chance, I'm certain that eventually uh, it will help that paradigm shift. So I'm going to end my presentation here. I'm very eager to hear what questions, uh, comments uh, you may have come up with. Thank you very much for your attention thus far. All right, great. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation, Michael. Uh, just to give everybody a quick reminder, you can either raise your hand. It's the little yellow hand button um, that you'll see in the little docking panel of your GoToWebinar control panel, or you can type your questions out into the questions pane, and my colleague Steve Chase will uh, proctor those two.
uh, Professor Nagler. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Steve, and he can uh, ask the first question that we've received. Sure. Well, thanks, uh, Michael, for that. Um, we've got a really interesting question here from one of the participants. Um, and he's pointing out that a lot of people adopt nonviolent action out of the, a theological or philosophical model, such as the one you're proposing, but also noting that there's many other motivations, um, including a much more sort of secular uh, perspective. And the question that he had is, what is the utility of proposing a model of great transformation in explicitly theological terms, and a very sort of specific one at that, that has the potential to exclude so many um, potential nonviolent allies? Well, that is a very good uh, question. It was uh, quite a serious issue for uh, Gene Sharp, and I think that's why he backed away from uh, what the questioner is calling the theological model, but I wouldn't call it theological. For me, it's more uh, just psychological and spiritual and scientific. It has to do with what we think a human being is. Uh, and I, as I did say, uh, my own attitude is I have no objection whatever if people want to simply explore nonviolence uh, without understanding why it works or without being dedicated to such a model. Uh, as uh, if you remember, I quoted Gandhi saying the weakest can partake in it. It's not going to do them any harm and may even help them to see that there is a higher reality that they have tapped into. I do acknowledge that there is a danger that some people will simply say it's impossible. We are not spiritual beings. Everything comes from the brain. Uh, there are lots of people who say that, um, but I think the benefit to helping other people understand why it is that their own deepest feelings uh, and emotions are what they are is going to outweigh the, the danger of the, what should we call them, the skeptics. Uh, I mean, for example, Right now, we have a situation in this country where about 20 veterans are committing suicide every day. And if you ask them why they're doing it, what is the source of their, their depression, their despair, they, they pretty much confirm what Gandhi was saying, that nonviolence is our nature. They say, I feel I lost my soul in Iraq. I don't like myself anymore. I don't know. You know, I, 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 I'm not the human being that I thought I was. There's that sense of very deep alienation that comes from practicing harming against other persons. So all I want to do is to give people an explanation for that because uh, on, that's what helps the, quote, movement toward peace uh, link up with the peace movement and become much more effective. So thank you for that question. It was really very thought-provoking. It's, it's really serious. There are some people who would be so skeptical that they would back away from any higher model, and they would say, if this is nonviolence, I don't believe it, and we will lose some of those people. But I think the benefit of uh, helping other people understand what it is that they're doing and how to make it work better will far, far outweigh the uh, temporary loss of uh, that, uh, that first group. For that one just quick thought that I'm having is sort of a follow-up is one way to frame it to not lose people is that um, that the kind of approach you're talking about is a cohort within a larger movement that adds some value but it's not it's not sort of the requisite entry point to engaging in civil resistance and things like that. It's, it's not an absolute requirement for people and it could be framed um, that way. We have a very specific question from a, a, another participant about in your personal power model, the first point of avoiding mass media. And that person says, if we should avoid mass media through the person power model, then what are your recommended ways of keeping up with world affairs and current events? 
Uh, that is, uh, incidentally, Steve, I really like the way you just formulated or reformulated my answer. I think that, that was very, uh, very accurate. Um, the question is not only a good one, but it is absolutely inevitable. We, we, we get it every single time. There are, first of all, alternative media um, that are readily available on the internet. Uh, there's little community offerings like uh, our own uh, nonviolence radio show that goes out every other week and goes up immediately, almost immediately on our website. It's picked up by other stations. I'm going to be in North Carolina next month at part of a festival for podcasters, so it'll be even more available. There are many, many resources that are out there. And also, you'll be surprised how much you can learn uh, from just talking with people. So that gets us down to the repersonalization point. If anything is really important in the world, you can hear about it from your friends. And that means you're doing two things at once. You're informing yourself about events, but you're also uh, having more of a personal connection, which is a tremendous antidote to the encroachment of authoritarianism and violence uh, on our world. I also, of course, in talking about avoiding the mass media, I'm also looking mainly, uh, not mainly, but also at entertainment forms. And they, in subtle and non-subtle ways, they can be extremely violent. And I, I actually regard the mass media as the kind of common enemy that might help uh, bring us all together into a single focus so that we can change the culture and take this great step forward in, in cultural evolution. So it's not easy to find entertainment media that are not uh, stimulating or assuming the background of violence, but we can find some. And the, for the rest of it, we can, you know, I always used to say a, a good latte with some friends is better than a two hour movie anytime. All right, great. Thank you for that, uh, Michael. So we have somebody who would like to uh, ask their question directly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute that person. Uh, Pete, it looks like you're self-muted. If you could go ahead and unmute yourself, you could ask your question to uh, Professor Nagler. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed that um, basically in the movements, they come in waves. Uh, people organize, they, they actively participate in civil disobedience, success or not, and then the wave retreats and the molecules of water disperse until another time another set of waves come in. Um, it's been difficult in, in my work to keep the particles of waves of water together and to keep the waves you know crashing against the, the sandcastle so the sandcastle falls down. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you bet. Uh, I, I love that image of the sandcastle. Well, that's, uh, there are two things that can happen uh, to make that wave uh, unstoppable and constant. One, as I said, uh, was strategy. And actually, Meta had a big strategy retreat just uh, two days ago. If we had a concerted strategy such that uh, we knew where our particular work and our particular episode fitted in to a long-term uh, cycle, then the wave would maintain its momentum and be able to benefit from these, what they call the effervescence of the crowd when it happens, but capture it and build it into a constant movement. And the other thing is, Gandhi's great secret in this regard was what he called constructive program, because people can't stop you or not stop you as easily from doing constructive program. If you went back home and were spinning a homemade kadi, homemade cloth, it wasn't even confrontational. It wasn't against the law. 
and that's one of the that way the movement could maintain its momentum there are other great advantages to constructive program that i discuss in the nonviolence handbook and and in search for a nonviolent future but he placed so much store by it that in 1942 when somebody came to him and said well what is it really going to take now to get the british out of here he said phenomenal progress in spinning because that gives people a sense of what they're doing as part of a larger whole, both socially and through time. And now you can choose constructive programs, which eventually do crash against that sandcastle. And at that point, they become aware of it, hopefully too late, and they try to stop you. And that's where you do the uh, satyagraha, the nonviolent action, the direct resistance. But you can do this in such a way that the powers that be don't find out about it until it's too late. And there's this famous episode where uh, the Viceroy of India, when the SALT campaign was just uh, getting started, he wired home to London and said, at the moment, I am not losing any sleep over the SALT campaign. But as we all know, it was a definitive break of the control of the Raj. Uh, over India. So construct the program and a long-term strategy that people feel that they're a part of. Those are the ways that we can capture that effervescence of the crowd and turn it into an unstoppable movement. Okay. Um, thank you for answering Pete's question. We have another question, which is somebody who noticed that um, in the slide you had where Gandhi was talking about weak or strong nonviolence um, and that you had reformulated it into sort of dimensions of deed, uh, word, and thought. And this person was wondering, did you do that reformulating because sort of using the term weak nonviolence um, that Gandhi used would actually make it harder in coalition building with you know secular advocates or people who aren't wouldn't think of themselves as pacifists and things like that and so as that was that person's concern that Gandhi's formulation could make coalition building harder and it was that part of your motivation in reformulating that these have been such wonderful questions uh, the answer the simple answer is yes that was part of my motivation but as you know by now, uh, Steve, I'm never satisfied with simple answers. So I will add to that a little bit that uh, I wasn't so much reformulating or abandoning Gandhi's dichotomy as simply mapping it onto something else that we could understand more scientifically. Because, you know, I, I know what you mean when you talk about. Uh, what is, am I against the deed or the person? I know what you mean when you talk about my speech and my actions. But weak and strong, well, they're kind of moralistic terms and moral vocabulary doesn't work all that well anymore. I think it's also the case that since the field of nonviolence is still somewhat new, uh, people come into it from different angles and they have different models. And I think there's some value to almost all of these models. So it's not like I was rejecting what he was saying. I was trying to articulate it in a way that uh, moderns can understand. It. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. I was partly motivated because it was uh, less off-putting. And I don't like to point my finger at people and call them cowards and say they're weak. Because guess what? So am I. Great, thanks. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is a person that was sort of wondering your thoughts on how to apply nonviolent action when, when, the, when the object, the target of the struggle is ending stereotypes or misconceptions. Yeah, well, in my experience, uh, some kind of spiritual practice is uh, almost a, a magical resolution for that. When you get deeper into your own consciousness, you see that uh, 
the things that separate us, like skin color or gender or economic class or whatever, are just on the surface, and our deeper reality is is going closer and closer to our interconnectedness and eventually our unity. So this is one of the reasons that I lay such great stress on changing the story, because in the uh, old story, the still prevailing story, we are primarily our physical bodies, which of course involves us in separateness, and then of course involves us in stereotyping. There is a beautiful scientific experiment that sheds a great deal of light on this. It was done at Princeton by Mary Wheeler and Susan Fisk. Uh, if you show, or say, okay, I happen to be Caucasian. If you put a face on the computer screen in front of me, that's from another race, uh, Asian or African, my uh, amygdala will fire up. It'll start making me go into a fight or flight response. But they didn't like this. And so they tried this experiment of saying before they flashed the, the face of a person from another race, they simply asked the question, we want you to tell us whether this person likes coffee or tea or some kind of stupid question like that. And what that did, it made you think of the person as a human being, as an individual and not as a member of a stereotype. So that was a terrific example of how science is showing us today how we can overcome some of these, the elements of the old story and all of the oppression that it involves.